Dr. Ballin spoke about stakeholders. Well, with more than 400,000 members, the Legion is a national stakeholder when you consider that a large percentage of our membership is approaching seniors' age. I would be remiss if I did not start by giving you greetings from our national president, Mary Ann Bivette, uh, who was elected as national president last year. She is the first female president of the Legion, and she's a resident of British Columbia in Terrace, BC. The Legion is a not-for-profit organization. We're entirely self-supporting. We accept no grants and funding from the government, and we are apolitical. In addition to providing services to veterans, we also advocate for seniors' issues. How do you tell somebody in a nice way that he is dying? You take a risk. Our society, unfortunately, has become enamored with risk aversion. Inadvertently, because of this, we end up failing to protect individuals in the transition to what ultimately is the goal of any life, dying with dignity. In trying to attain a risk-free society, we fail to offer proper, sensitive, long-term, and palliative care through rules and regulations that often deter those that want to help. For example, we may be unwilling to offer a dying person a drink of water for fear of legal action. We are afraid to offer the gift of touching another human being. Care practitioners may be restricted to help someone who has fallen out of bed until they get a hold of the right tool. Avoiding risk has become a mantra. At the same time that we are trying to avoid risk, we are trying to do the impossible. Stretch the limits, curb the incurable. Yet, in sickness and dying, we depend upon others. We do take risks. Advances in medicine have the capacity to extend life beyond what we experience today. However, extended life does not equate to enhanced quality of life, nor can we assume that quality of life is assured through medical care alone. In view of increasingly scarce health care resources, demographic patterns, and life-saving decisions that may have problematic results, we may wonder what will happen to Canadians as they approach the end of life. And we've shared the poignant truth that does not discriminate on the basis of age alone. Palliative care is synonymous with a holistic approach to that. Yet, palliative care exists in uneasy partnership with advanced medical technology, which allows terminally ill patients to live longer without necessarily addressing their need for pain relief and comfort. In dealing with these conflicting ideals, we need to adopt, to adopt a wellness approach that can help us to deal with complex situations. What is palliative care? It is defined by the World Health Organization as follows, and I quote, the active total care of patients whose disease is not responsive to curative treatment, control of pain, of other symptoms, and of psychological, social, and spiritual problems are paramount. The goal of palliative care is the achievement of the best possible quality of life for patients and their families. We should compare this World Health Organization definition to the one provided by Health Canada, which attempts to link and expand geriatric and palliative care into a single definition, and I quote, and of life care for seniors requires an active, compassionate approach that treats, comforts, and support older individuals who are living with or dying from progressive or chronic life-threatening conditions. Such care is sensitive to personal, cultural, and spiritual values, beliefs, and practices, and encompasses support for families and friends up to and including the period of bereavement. It is interesting to note that the Canadian definition is not only focused on the patients, but attempts to be all-inclusive, merging two different concepts, living with and dying, 
and including friends in the transition and bereavement processes. That is good. However, the Elk Canada definition seems to ignore the context of pain. Canadian regional palliative care associations do, however, recognize the requirement for relief of pain. The basic premise of palliative care should be the provision of comprehensive care for the dying, including relief from pain in any setting of choice, including dying at home. Some basic questions should be addressed in the provision of palliative care, including what institutional services are available for the terminally ill? How, where, and by whom are these, patient, are these patients treated? How aggressive and costly is the care provided? Who approves the final decision as to the level of care? Are there options that should be considered to facilitate the provision of end-of-life care in other than dedicated facilities? And are these options sufficiently well-funded? We have heard that in Canada, there is no uniform national standard of palliative care. Standardized palliative care services are not covered in the Canada Health Act. Like Senator Carstairs has said, there are pockets of palliative care services across Canada, but palliative care as a core services is only recognizes in some, not all provinces. Services to cover option of dying at home are relatively unavailable. The majority of hospice beds are reserved for cancer patients, and there is still a high dependency on private fundraising to cover the cost of palliative care. This is a non-standardized approach to palliative care, which is actually very scary when considering the demographics and the lack of resources allocated to palliative care. Canada enjoys one of the best life expectancy coupled with a very low infant mortality rate. The net result has been an ever-increasing percentage of our population being 60 year, 65 years or more. Yet, we still die. Approximately 220,000 Canadians died in 2003. The number is expected to increase by 40% to approximately 315,000 in 2020. The federal government has allocated $16 million for palliative care. Over five, for palliative care research over five years, beginning in 2003, what I would call a rather paltry sum. Under the new health accord signed between the federal government and provincial health authorities, provinces agreed to give the dying better access to pain medication, nursing, and personal care by 2006. We have been told that medical students will be better trained in palliative care by 2008. While these, what I would call, baby steps are good, the funding provided is still inadequate. There is no single entry point to access palliative care. There is no standardized access for those with heart and kidney diseases. In light of this very fragile situation, it is logical for some to consider suicide an assisted suicide. Suicide was a criminal off offense in Canada until 1974. With an amendment to the criminal code, the state could no longer prosecute a person who attempted but failed to take his or her own life. Counseling or assisting suicide has continued to be an offense in accordance with section 241 of the criminal code. In September 93, the, the Supreme Court of Canada concluded that the state's interest in protecting life should prevail over the individual's desire to die, upholding the criminal ban, code ban on assisted suicide. And in the same vein, health care practitioners can be found guilty of homicide for failing to provide medical treatment when to do so is or may be dangerous to life. A number of groups, such as Dying with Dignity and the Right to Die Network, are campaigning for law reform. At the very least, fully discussing end-of-life options with the dying should be allowed, including pain control protocols and their outcome. As we advocate for clearer legal direction and protection for practitioners, more resources must be allocated to palliative care immediately. 
as a growing percentage of financial resources for care are concentrated at the end of people's lives, the ethical, financial, and political issues will intensify and will bring intense scrutiny to the process. In concert with the ethical, financial, and political dimensions, the considerable emphasis on patient empowerment and patient autonomy must be addressed. In considering the delivery of effective palliative care, we should focus on the art of the possible within the current constraints. The first decision that one has to address should be when to stop treatment of a fatal disease. Doctors will be inclined to continue treatment for as long as possible. And because of the explosion in worldwide communication, which provides almost instantaneous transmissions of knowledge about new life-saving technologies, the adoption by practitioners of invasing interventions are increasingly attractive. These should be resisted. Palliative care should focus on routine nursing procedures. Routine nursing, but fundamental root procedures, focus on moving the patient to avoid bed sores, bathing, changing clothing, and providing basic sanitation, and very importantly, pain management. Even these decisions are not simple. For example, moving the patient to avoid bed sores may actually cause excruciating pain. Practitioners are called upon routinely to exercise judgment and to make decisions that can result in criticism. I think like Dr. Kuhl said so well, in those instances, as witnesses to life and death, we must learn to suspend judgment. The Veterans Independence Program administered by Veterans Affairs Canada is actually a precursor in dealing with an aging clientele. This basic program allows more than 80,000 veterans and primary caregivers to live independently in their own homes while receiving benefits not provided by provinces for the cost of ground maintenance, housekeeping, and other ancillary benefits. The Legion has been advocating for a similar program for all Canadian seniors. One element of VIP which does not get much publicity is palliative care. Not surprisingly, because of the age of our traditional veterans, Veterans Affairs Canada is committed to support clients who require palliative care through specialized benefits, including VIP supplements. For VAC, palliative care is defined as care provided to a client who is diagnosed to be in the last stages of life with a current medical prognosis from the client's physician of three months or less. Palliative care can be provided in a long-term care facility, an active care hospital, a designated palliative care unit, on a daycare, outpatient or inpatient basis, or increasingly in a home setting by a spouse or primary caregivers such as family members. Clients must be counseled by a physician on the options and risk of dying at home in an institution or a nursing home. A plan must be developed with the client or his power of attorney to meet the client's needs by incorporating physical, psychosocial, and spiritual support provided by a multidisciplinary team, including physicians, nurses, social workers, and clergy, what Dr. Balin would call a continuum. Obviously, there are some eligibility requirements before palliative care is approved. However, if the basic requirements are met, the expected cost of care for a client wanting to die at home, which might be approximately $3,000 a week for possibly a 10-week period, would be approved by Veteran Affairs Canada. The ultimate authority to approve a palliative care at home options depends on the overall cost of treatment, which actually must be extended out to 52 weeks because these predictions are not always true. As a way ahead, Extending some form of VIP and life care to all Canadians would make perfect sense. Denial of services on the basis of age is not an option that is clearly a gross form of neglect. However, the provision of services should be linked to the capacity to benefit of the individual concern. Decision making should be clearly vested in the patient and the doctor which should have equal rights and equal protection. 
Doctors should not be penalized if they are implementing an aggressive pain management protocol to ease the suffering of a patient who is clearly at end of life stage and who has made an informed choice. As Dr. Spears has said, this choice must be made by a mentally competent, terminally ill adult. If an individual is no longer competent to make a decision regarding health care, including the refusal or withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment, the physician should refer and adhere to the patient's informed consent directives as expressed when still competent. And if no such directive exists, the patient and the patient is not competent, a surrogate decision maker should make the decision that the patient would have made if competent. Any decision, including the right to live and to die with comfort and dignity, should be respected. And if the choice is to die at home, we should not forget the needs of the caregiver. Philosophically, death is not a failure but a normal transition. It should not be a living grave. There must be more public discussion and public education on issues of advanced directives, on end-of-life options, such as moving into dedicated facilities, hospices, long-term care or hospital, or remaining at home. And like Senator Carstairs has said, at home must be understood in the broader sense of including such places as long-term care facilities. Whatever choice is made, terminally ill people should be provided with adequate financial, social, medical, and spiritual support they should get information on available pain control protocols and their results or their outcomes on life expectancy. Finally, a national VIP-like program for end-of-life care should be implemented in all federal and provincial jurisdiction. Combined with the compassionate care program that has been implemented by, at the federal level, this would provide the building stones of a humane end-of-life care for all Canadians. These recommendations should be considered on a first priority. And to paraphrase Dr. Kuhl, we should also learn more about the education of the heart, and we should not forget the grief of those that stay behind. Thank you.